joy to be together tonight. And uh, what a wonderful thing to know that Jesus is coming again. Amen. And what a thrilling day that will be, hopefully tonight. And I hope that you are looking forward to his coming with great anticipation. We're going to sing about his coming all night tonight. Let's stand together. We'll turn to page number 274. Will Jesus find us watching? We'll join together on the first and the last. the shelter out, we took an entire dumpster uh, load of stuff to the dumpster place, wherever they haul that to, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be able to use that place in an incredible way beginning Tuesday. We're, you're going to learn about this from, from uh, Pastor Caleb, who's going to be telling us all about Tuesday in just a few moments to tell you everything to do so you'll be able to enjoy the day, <clears throat> but it took a lot of work. Uh, three days and even some hours after that and I want to thank Pastor Caleb he was texting me while we were away <clears throat> and was telling me about hey pastor was able to take this junk and we made this money and we <laughs> please forgive me I've always called the sign that we brought from Eagledale I've always called that the beer sign <laughs> and so he sold the beer sign for a hundred dollars I was so glad he did that <laughs> Uh, so he almost made enough money in the junk to cover the dumpster. And so we're glad. So Pastor Caleb, all the teens that helped you, let's give them a round of applause. They worked hard to make it nice for us. We'll be able to, we'll be able to use that this year. He's going to use it a lot outside with, with the teens. And Eric Rogers is, uh, has been a great blessing and a help. He is a very quiet man behind the scenes has a CDL license, takes time off from work, and does those things to serve the Lord. And we, we are so thankful for the Rogers family. God has given us some tremendous families, and this is one of them. And we're glad that they're part of our church family. Come and open our service in prayer. Let's pray. Good Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to meet here, Lord. We just also thank you for this great country coming up on this holiday weekend. Uh, we just want to take the time to uh, just to expressly say thank you uh, for the opportunity to openly worship you, uh, something that's not allowed in other countries. And Lord, we just, we're just so thankful. Lord, we also just want to ask you to bless this time together, bless the pastor as he brings us uh, the sermon. And um, and also just bless the rest of this time in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Page number 282. Number 282. We'll join together all three verses. Marvelous message we bring. Jesus is coming again. Marvelous message we bring.
to fill you in on tonight. First of all, the senior saints uh, that are going on the trip that, that's coming up very quickly. There's a meeting right after the service to fill you in on some of the details of what's coming up and things to prepare for. And then as Pastor mentioned, we'll be having our 4th of July picnic outside of the picnic shelter this Tuesday. It starts at 11 o'clock. You can come dressed in picnic uh, attire for picnics and games. And there'll be some uh, games for the children on up. And the winners get a 4th of July fun pack. So that, that sounds pretty cool. I don't know what that is. I hope it has something explosive, right? 4th of July. Uh, no, but uh, 4th of July fun pack for those come. Uh, hot dogs and, and, and lemonade and paper products will be provided by the church. And then you can provide snacks for your family uh, as you go to it. And we are looking for uh, two grills. Uh, if you have a grill that you can bring uh, to be able to help grill those hot dogs, uh, the more the merrier, really. So if you would like to, uh, contact Pastor Chris or Nicole, and they'll get with you, and we can get those grills going. So if you have a grill that you could bring, pack up, and bring with you to the 4th, uh, that would be a big help as we seek to, be a, to, to have a lot of fun together and learn from God's Word. Once again, Pastor Ham will be preaching for that Tuesday night together. speakers. And so as they come, let me remind you, uh, matter of fact, one of our men had to work today, uh, tonight, and uh, he uh, shoved uh, some money in my hand and told me to put it in the offering for the special offering tonight. These, this offering is for all of our speakers. I'm going to ask that you give as you would in a normal revival meeting so that we can divide these funds up between the four speakers that we have coming. Next week, Pastor Thomason, David Thomason, pastor of the Troy Baptist Temple, will be here, and he will be our speaker. 
and we're looking forward to his ministry. I have listened to him preach online several times. He is an excellent preacher and uh, a loving pastor. I've had the privilege of doing a couple of funerals with him over there uh, since he became pastor over two years ago now. And I'll have the privilege in August of going over and speaking at a special service uh, that they're having. And so I'm really looking forward to having the pastor of Troy Baptist Temple come here and preach. So strategically, there's there's rhyme and reason about why and, and how uh, I come to the conclusion of inviting these speakers under the direction, of course, mainly of the Lord. Dolly and I have our offering for our speakers uh, this month. I trust that everyone here will join in giving uh, to this special offering, and then we will take uh, our normal Sunday night offering up in just a few moments. Father, thank you in advance for meeting the needs of these four speakers that you brought our way. And I pray, Lord, it would be sufficient to take care of things like the time that they came and the travel and all that they do uh, to minister to us. Thank you for Kenny and his, his preaching this morning and how it pricked our hearts, and we're grateful for it. And we ask, Lord, that you would use him again today and also on Tuesday morning, that, Lord, you would use him in a special way continually. Thank you for the privilege of he and Terry being here and thank you father for the rest of our speakers that as we give tonight we will give to a good cause we'll give to uh, sharing our blessings with men of God who came to minister to us and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name amen <laughs> Page number 281, we'll join on that first verse. My Lord will come maybe today. My Lord will come.
singing, we'll turn over to page number 276. Number 276. We'll join together on both verses, a song that we don't sing very often, but a song that we ought to have in our hearts and minds. We ought to be listening for the trumpet to sound and looking forward to that day. We'll join together both verses. Listen for the trumpet. privilege it is once again to come back into your house and learn from you. And Lord, as we are preparing to, our hearts to hear Pastor Ham preach, let us do so with hearts that are, ears are ready to hear and hearts that are willing to apply and that we may live out the doctrine that we're receiving. We thank you uh, for the message we heard this morning and, we, and the one we're about to hear tonight. And Lord, as we take part right now in, in offering uh, our offerings to you, Lord, that we may we do so with hearts of gratitude for all that you've done for us. We thank you in your name. Amen.
just a quick reminder for those in choir, if you missed your opportunity to give for the speaker's offering tonight, uh, there will be an usher at the door with a plate you can give to that uh, this evening. So if you did miss your opportunity and you'd like to give to that, please do so after the service. What a joy it is uh, to have uh, Pastor Kenny and, and Terry Ham with us uh, this weekend. And uh, it's a joy to be able to spend time in school. I believe we came the same year and, uh, and uh, uh, enjoyed meeting them and uh, getting to know them. And it was such a, a joy to watch. Um, Kenny always had a desire to do right. And um, that's not always easy in college. And uh, there are those of us who were there that helped write a few extra pages in the handbook. And, um, <laughs> but uh, what a joy to see as, as uh, we have been uh, called and moved out into ministry and the Lord is Amen. blessing and then to be able to come back together and to minister. And it's such a, a privilege to have uh, he and Terry with us. Open your hearts and, and your ears. Be attentive to the Spirit as he comes tonight, and he'll be a blessing to you. Well, it's a joy to be back with you this evening, and I'd just like to say how much uh, we have enjoyed being with you already today, and uh, your music program is just phenomenal. We have so enjoyed your music program, and uh, as Chris said, he and I went to school together, and uh, also, uh, Brother Dan, Pastor Dan, um, his nephew, Clinton, uh, worked two summers with us doing an internship. And uh, his niece, uh, Kayla, also worked with us down in Macon. And uh, I've just met uh, Pastor uh, Caleb for the first time today. And, but I've been keeping up with him through the Youth Pastor's Pencil and his website for the teens. And I want to tell you something. That is the sharpest website I've ever seen for a youth group. And the time he puts into that is just, it's just amazing. He has a true spirit of excellence. And I, I so appreciate uh, your spirit of excellence here. Well, if you would please take your Bibles and let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And this evening... Uh, we covered the first half this morning. This evening, I'm going to try and get through the second half and probably won't be as long as this morning, but uh, we'll, we'll try to work down through here. And I want to begin there in verse number 11. So notice verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Let's ask the Lord now to bless our time together. Thank you, Lord, for this time together with Cross Point Baptist Church, what sweet people they are. Uh, Lord, I thank you uh, for the testimony of this church and the leadership of this church. I pray that you would bless this church, Lord. And uh, we see that you're blessing and we see uh, plans to expand. And Lord, that's so exciting. And we thank you for how you're blessing here. And I just pray your uh, many more blessings upon this ministry and their staff and the folks here. And now, Lord, as we go into your word, give us understanding. Lord, move me out of the way and teach us from your holy word tonight. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Now, one of the most majestic sights in the United States is the great peaks of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, many of them are covered with snow year-round because of their high elevation. Yet as beautiful as they are, because of their high elevation... There's no soil there, there's no moisture there, and therefore nothing grows on the mountaintops. And, and once you go above the tree line, there are no people there, no plants, no vegetation, no animals, nothing. No sign of life. The mountains are beautiful to look at, but they're not a place to stay. It reminds me of the Apostle Peter over in Luke chapter 9. As he was there on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord, 
And I like to read those verses. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. So Peter was amazed by what he saw there on the Mount of Transfiguration, and any one of us would have been. And he wanted to just stay right there. And he was fine to just stay there and leave the rest of the world behind. Peter's desire, it's understandable. But this thinking was based on a lack of understanding God's plan. Because God does not call us to withdraw from people. But instead, he calls us to unity. And the first prerequisite of unity is to be in the company of other people. And, you know, let's face it, some people uh, struggle with this. Some people struggle. Uh, are, there's extroverts, then there's introverts. And, you know, extrovert, they, they really charge their batteries by being around other people. They've got to have it. They just have to be around other people. And then there are introverts that uh, they charge their batteries away from people. Not to say that they don't like people or that they're crazy or anything. They just charge their batteries away from people. And, uh, and the church is made up, uh, we know this, of many different personalities. Uh, many different backgrounds represented in this building tonight. Uh, many different occupations. Uh, but you know, that's the beauty of it all is that people from all walks of life can come together on this common ground called the blood of Jesus, and we can come together in fellowship. And I've just always thought that that is really neat, uh, to see people come together uh, from two different ends of the spectrum and be able to love each other and get along, because when we come in here, all of those things, uh, the, the, the class, the culture, uh, the color, everything is out the door, and we come together as one. And yes, we should spend time alone with God. In fact, on Sunday nights at our church back home, I'm preaching a series uh, by a book. Uh, it's a book by Joseph C. Carroll on how to worship Jesus Christ. And it's not a corporate worship uh, type thing that uh, you would find in a bookstore today. Uh, it's really and truly centered around personal worship. Us spending time alone with God, and that is important. We should do that every day. But most of our life is lived out in the company of other people. So now in the second half of chapter 2, Paul turns to the subject of unity. And this morning in the first half of chapter 2, we saw the believer's declaration of independence and that we, uh, he quickened us, uh, he made us alive spiritually. He raised us from the grave and set us free from the graveyard of sin never to have to return again. And when we were quickened by God, we experienced a divine touch, a type of superhuman energy, if you will. When we were made alive in Christ, we received spiritual senses, something that all uh, the goodness, all of the, the wisdom, all of the godliness of man could not work in us. Only God could have done that. And the greater effect of our quicken, quickening is now that we are now sensitive to the things of God, the, not only the things of God, but also the people of God. This is very important, that the people of God be sensitive to each other. And this is what Paul is about to teach us in the remainder of chapter 2. In the first half, he emphasized our position in Christ. Now, in the second half, he's going to emphasize our position with one another. And it's very important because all of our possessions that we read about over in chapter 1, back in chapter 1, the blessings of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, those riches in Christ, all of those possessions hinge on our position in Christ. These are the qualities that make the body of Christ work. Uh, this is the power cord to the whole operation, if you will. And remember this morning, I gave you a list of those things that take place at our quickening. We were given new insight. 
new intellect, new knowledge, new discernment, new wisdom, and new understanding. And these are the qualities that power the whole thing. And we can say that because these qualities come from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that took place at our salvation. And enables us to come together as a unified body of believers loving each other. And there's, there's no room for that spirit of hate. There's no room, and that's what he's teaching here uh, to these uh, Jews and Gentiles. There's no room for that in the body of Christ. And there's no room for that uh, a, a spirit that never can understand things. And, and they're always controversial. And, uh, and that's a very dangerous place to be. And as I said this morning, for the person that stays there, and, and they're always just difficult, prickly, you know, there's a problem with that. And people shouldn't be that way. We should love each other. Uh, Throughout the years, we, uh, I'm no longer a youth pastor, of course. I'm pastor there now, but I was a youth pastor for close to 16 years. And we did a number of mission trips to New York and uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, mainly. And several churches there that we would go to. And I remember going to one of the churches there in Brooklyn, uh, Bay Ridge Baptist Church. And uh, after church was over that morning, I noticed all the people just kind of hanging around. And they were just staying there. An hour went by. They were still there. And I, I asked the pastor, I, I said, Brother Jason, I said, hey, uh, I said, are, are they, do they go home? I said, are they just going to stay? He said, well, you know, pastor, it's like this. They live in a concrete jungle all week long, and it's very difficult, and they just long to get here. And some of them are coming an hour away by train to get here every Sunday. And this is the highlight of their week. You know, that ought to be that way for all of us, shouldn't it? We should look at church that way, that we just can't wait to get here to see our brethren and sisters in Christ and spend time together. Here in the second half of chapter 2, we'll see the believer's constitution, which is centered, focused, driven, and powered by the believer's unity. Every bit of it. You know, it's interesting to note the preamble to the United States Constitution begins, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect unity. Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. The very first thing listed there in the Constitution is that we would form a better unity. In other words, if America was going to keep her independence and grow as a nation, we would have to be unified. And we would have to be unified in every branch and aspect of our new government. Paul's doing the same here as he describes the believer's unity. What I really should say is that James Madison was doing the same uh, as he followed Paul's example as he was writing the Constitution. Unity is the quintessential of the body of believers. So notice with me this evening, the believer's constitution. Jesus prayed over in John 17 and verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe. I want to say that again. That the world may believe. Very important. We're going to come back to that later in the sermon. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. He was praying here for the unity of the church and those new believers there. And, and we see the answer to this prayer in Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. And this is true positionally. We may not always think it is, but it is true positionally because remember, as believers, as those who have been quickened by God in Christ, we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus right now, positionally. But now practically, it doesn't always work that way, does it? It doesn't. It's true. There's always going to be... Uh, that prickly person in your life. There's a, and, and by the way, it's gonna, there's going to be prickly people in the church that you have to learn how to deal with. 
Paul said, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, all distinctions of class, culture, and race are non-existent in Christ. And when God looks at us, he sees us as one. As C.H. Spurgeon said, there is no class system, there is no hierarchy, there are no blue ribbon sheep. There's absolute equality. And there's only one distinction for this body of believers tonight. And that one distinction is to be in Christ. First key element of the book of Ephesians. The Gentiles were without Christ. That is, they had no promise of a Messiah. They were not a part of the nation of Israel. In fact, the Old Testament law puts a great gulf between the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Corinthian church, Paul was constantly grieved and bothered by their discord. In chapter 1, verse 10, he said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. And this was a real problem. And it still is today. Churches pitted against churches. Believers against believers. The problem of discord and disunity. But I don't know that there's ever been a worse time than that between the Jews and the Gentiles. There's never been a greater racial hatred than that of the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, In fact, the Jews thought that the Gentiles were created to fuel the fires of hell. They thought that only Israel was loved by God and all other nations were hated by God. It wasn't lawful to help a Gentile woman give birth to a child. You would be guilty of bringing yet another Gentile into the world. When the Jews traveled from the southern part of Israel to the northern part of Israel, there was a small area there in the middle called Samaria. They wouldn't travel through there. They would cross over the Jordan River, then they would go upstream and then cross back over. They wouldn't go through there because those people were not full-blooded Jews. And they didn't even want as much as take the sand of their ground back into their homeland. And so they would cross over and bypass Samaria. And this is why it was so shocking when the Lord Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. And he was teaching them and teaching them how to be a witness. And and as far as the Gentiles were concerned, well, they weren't innocent in all of this. They looked at the Jews as nothing more than slaves, useless to society, which carried on all the way to the days of Adolf Hitler. Paul wants to tear down that wall of partition. And he wants to bring together together the people as one. And listen, to be in Christ, it truly does remove all barriers. We become family. That's the bigger picture of this. We become family. And, and, And this is the whole thrust here in the book of Ephesians. Now, you may ask, How or why did God choose Israel, the Jewish people? Well, understand, God never chose Israel to be the Fort Knox of his grace, his blessings, and his riches. He chose Israel uh, to pour through them and for them to be a channel to the rest of the world. His intention was not to just dump everything into Israel for their own benefit, but to pour through them his blessings to the rest of the world. And that was his intention. God said, uh, they will show forth my praise. Israel was supposed to be a mirror reflecting God to the rest of the world. When Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This was nothing new to God. This was nothing new to the Lord Jesus. But it was new to those men that he was sharing it with. This was new to them. And we see this going all the way back to Father Abraham when God said in Genesis 12 and verse 3, And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Here it is. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Then in Isaiah 49 and verse 6, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles 
that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. That has always been God's plan. So if this be the case, why did God separate Israel from the rest of the world, you may ask? Why all of the strict laws, the clothing laws, the, the, the dietary laws, the marriage laws, uh, the, the worship laws, the festival laws, the land laws, and on and on and on? Why so many strict laws? God wanted to make it impossible for the Jews to assimilate themselves into any other culture in the world. God wanted them to be so different that the rest of the world would take note. And the rest of the world did take note. But instead of Israel being the witness God intended, you know what happened. They became carnal. They became selfish and self-glorified. Rejecting the rest of the world and rejecting the lost and ultimately rejecting Christ. No room for the lost, no room for Christ. And it's still happening today. We see it all the time. Us four no more shut the door. The world has been locked out when it comes to evangelism in the local church. And I'm afraid to say that many churches, in many cases, Christ has been ushered out. And they have their own agenda and their own plan. And some people within the body of Christ really, really struggle with church growth. They, tr they struggle with cultural differences. And they have thoughts like this. Well, you know, that person, uh, that person's from another part of the country and, and they're just kind of strange. Or what about this? Uh, well, that person, they're, they're, they're educated and I'm intimidated whenever I speak with them. Or that person's from the other side of the tracks. You know, that guy, he, he really lived a rough life before he got saved. And, and, you know, I'm just not real comfortable around those kind of people. Or what about this one? Well, you know, that person has a different skin color. And I don't feel that we should mix our worship in different races. And listen, if that's your thinking, stop acting like the Jews because it was their same thinking. This is how they were thinking. And in Christ, we become one. All barriers, all walls, as we're going to see in a minute, are removed when we are in Christ. You know, about two years ago, this movement started uh, called Black Lives Matter. And, and I, I'm only sharing this for illustrative purposes. I'm not trying to be political with you in any form or fashion here. It's just for illustrative purposes. And you'll see where I'm going with this. And I'm all for freedom of speech. And we do have the right to that in America. We have the right to protest should we disagree with something. And I'm all for that. I'm not for the violence. I'm certainly not for the violence that has taken place in that movement in many ways. And it should never be the case of violence. And especially down in the south where I'm from, people really get frustrated with that movement. But you know, we really should get frustrated with ourselves. Because listen, it really goes back to when African Americans were learning to read and write. And the first book they were reading was the Bible. And many of them were getting saved. And uh, their owners were saying, well, it's great. You can have a Bible. You can get saved. You can believe in my God. But hey, wait a minute. You can't come to my church. And so they had their own church. And they were closed out. And for illustrative purposes, it's the same thing that was happening between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was a racial hatred there. And it shouldn't be that way. Uh, I pastor a multicultural church just like this one. In the South, which is, which is very unique. But we should have that true love for the brethren, regardless race, culture, or class. Because when we come in the church, all of that is out the back door. And we are one in Christ. Israel became proud and elevated themselves as if they were better than everyone else. 
And oh, how we should guard ourselves from ever having this mentality. Because you see, it was that mentality among the Jews that God determined to set them aside and use the Gentiles. And primarily since the resur resurrection of Christ, the Gentiles have carried the gospel message. He begins in our text by reminding the Gentiles how they were once alienated. And I, I want you to notice first here the blight of alienation. And, and we see here, go back there to verse 11. If you will, please go back to verse 11 in our text. And we see here first that they were socially alienated. Notice verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. The Jews referred to the Gentiles as the uncircumcision. It was a term of mockery and ridicule uh, because they didn't have the, the physical sign of Genesis 17 to mark them as God's people. Remember when David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? It was a term of mockery and ridicule that David was using against Goliath the giant. And the Jews, in contrast, they called themselves the circumcision, a name they were very proud of. But Paul reminded them that they are not a Jew by physical and outward means. You see, they possessed the outward formalities with no inward reality. And that's why Paul said in Romans 2 and verse 29, he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. They were socially alienated, but also they were spiritually alienated. Notice verse 12 in our text. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the, common, from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. They were without Christ, worshiping the goddess of Diana in the temple of Artemis. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers and foreigners, people without the right of citizenship. They were without covenant. Uh, strangers from the covenants of the promise. He's speaking of the Abrahamic promise here uh, from Genesis chapter 12, that promise that encapsulates all other promises. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant encapsulates the Mosaic, the Davidic, the Palestinian, and the New Covenant. And this is very important because it was through these covenants that God promised to bless, prosper, multiply, and save them and to give them a kingdom, but most importantly, to give them a king. All of this was designed for eternal life. They were without Christ. They were without hope, and namely, the hope of the resurrection. Like the modern-day humanists, the Gentiles believed that when you took your last breath, it was over. Lights out, nothing more, that was it. They were without God. They were Christless, stateless, covenantless, hopeless, and godless. And you know, that's the state also of a lost person. And boy, when we think of this terminology tonight, and we compare that to the lost people we're praying for, it really puts some fire under our prayers, doesn't it? But also, I want you not only the blight of alienation, but also notice next the bridge of unity there in verse 13. And there's nothing that could bridge the gap between God and man except the blood of Jesus. Nothing that could bridge the gap between man and his fellow man but the blood of Jesus. And notice here, his blood changed our position, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Paul just reminded us back in verse 12 of our, lace, our, our lost state. But now in verse 13... Uh, he, he begins it, and folks, this is a great verse. But now, in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, being in Christ changes everything for us. Amen. Because, listen, when we are in Christ, we are unified as a body of believers. We are family. Remember who we are. We are the very children of God. We are family. And, and that is, is true of Christians everywhere. We are families in the body of Christ. 
The story was told of a, a gentleman at the Art Museum in Washington, D.C. And as he was staring at a painting of the crucifixion, he began to weep. People around him were watching. And as tears flowed down his face, he began to say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Some of the folks in there, most of them, thought he was crazy. But before long, another man came along who was a Christian. And he came over and joined him. He said, I love the Lord too. And oh, Lord, I thank you too. And this went on and on until about nine to ten men had gathered there. Now get it. These men never knew each other. But they were family. They never met. They were family. They didn't know anything about each other, but they were family. And they may not ever see each other again after that day, but they were family. And they had that sweet, sweet connection, that bond. Oh, dear friends, it is so amazing when we look at this in its entirety. The whole of coming together and the value in this. And uh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we're going to see, or excuse me, Tuesday morning, we'll see the true value in this of, of church unity and believers coming together. And, and I know from everything your pastor tells me here, you have a great unified church. Uh, he, he had no clue what I was preaching on. It's just what the Lord laid on my heart. And uh, he, I know you have a great unified church here. There, you could be someone in here that has an odd or difference with someone. You should make that right. But uh, I don't want you to think he primed me to preach this because he didn't. The unbelieving Gentiles, <laughs> the unbelieving Gentiles were far off. Meaning they were without hope. They were without God. And that's the way it used to be. But now Paul explains all people can be made nigh or brought near by the blood of Jesus. Brought near was to be admitted to God's favor. It was in reference to the tabernacle because the Jews were close to the tabernacle. And the Gentiles were far off as they set their camp. And it's referring because there in the tabernacle, that's where the glory of God abode and that's where uh, His blessings were poured in. But now they were brought near to that. Uh, and they were now taking part of God's dwelling place. Taking part in God's dwelling place among the Israelites. His blood changed our position. But also notice, His blood removed all barriers. Notice verse 14. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In 1961... Uh, the Germans put up a wall there in Berlin that separated part of Germany from the rest of Germany and from the rest of Europe, and you remember the, the wall there. And I remember maybe you were watching this on the news in 1989 when that wall came down. Uh, that was uh, when Ronald Reagan gave the speech earlier that year, and he said, General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace for your people, if you seek prosperity for your people, come to this wall. Tear down this wall. And then in 1989, the wall did come down. In fact, if you visit his grave at his library out in Simi Valley, California, uh, there at his grave, right beside his grave, is a big chunk of that wall. It still has graffiti on it and everything. Uh, that was one of the highlights of his administration, was having that wall taken down. And when that wall came down, many families lost their lives trying to cross over that wall to get to their family and, and friends on the other side. Many people were killed. There was a hatred there between the authorities. But when the wall came down, people embraced each other. Enemies embraced each other. Peace erupted in the streets of Europe. And that's much the same here of what Paul is doing. Paul is doing, on, doing this on a much grander scale. There in the temple was an outer court called the Court of the Gentiles. And you can see the diagram here. The Gentiles were forbidden to go any further than the outer court. It was divided from the rest of the temple by a middle wall of partition. And they couldn't go beyond this point. In fact, in 1871, archaeologists discovered an inscription from the temple at the time of Paul. It was placed between the court of the Gentiles and the rest of the temple. The inscription reads, No foreigner 
may enter within this barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. They would be killed if they went beyond that barrier. I mean, this was serious business. And also, that court of the Gentiles, it was intended by God to be a place for Jewish evangelism. But instead, they turned it into a flea market. It's the same place where Jesus went in and he upturned the money changer tables. Same place. They should have been using it as an outreach, but they blew it. They missed their opportunity. It strongly parallels the false prophets of our day. As we see this happening in many churches today as they're using church as a means of marketing and money making. But also we see his blood brought us peace. Verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The purpose of the law was love. But the Jews used it as a form of hatred. It created enmity instead of unity. And this was not at God's mistake. This, it was totally opposite of what God had intended. And it never was to his fault. Once again, it came back to the fall of man. Just as man destroyed the garden and just as man destroyed civilization in the day of Noah, he has now destroyed the law. And it all goes back to the fall of man, our sin. It's not that we had a wishy-washy God trying to figure out how to run everything and, and do it. It was on us. It was our fault. And then Paul explains why Jesus abolished the enmity of the law. And notice that it says he abolished the enmity, not the law. Because remember, Christ is superior to the law because he fulfilled the law. And he didn't come to destroy the law. And he says here he came, that he came to destroy the enmity. Notice verse 15, for to make it himself, this is the reason why he did this, to make it himself of twain, one new man, so making peace. And these people were misusing the law and all of the over some 6,000 laws, rules, and regulations that they were to follow in their Jewish ceremonies and their rites and everything that they were to carry out and they were totally using it the wrong way. It was all meant to be an evangelism tool, but they blew it. He would now make the Jews and Gentiles into one body of peace, which brings us to the body of Christ. We see the blight of alienation. We see the bridge of unity, but now I want you to see the body of Christ. And notice first there in verse 19, he gave us citizenship to the kingdom of God. Notice verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. But we're not only fellow citizens, we are family. We're not just strangers, naturalized, allowed to be in the kingdom. We are considered family. Romans 8, 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We are family. But also notice in verses 20 through 22, he gave us a foundation to grow in holiness. Notice verse 20. I want to go back and read verse 19. I don't believe I read that, but I want to get that in. Now, therefore, ye... Are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Our foundation was built upon the writings of the Old Testament prophets and the apostles of the New Testament with Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. The, the cornerstone back in these days, the cornerstone was the supporter. Uh, it, it was the main support of the building. It was the unifier. It was the connector. It was the overall strength of the building. It was everything, and it is a picture of Jesus Christ. 
Meaning, in Christ, all believers are jointed, I said jointed, together. The idea here is that is that of a mortise and tenon in the wood shop. Tightly fit together, providing strength and stability and support for each other. And that's the whole idea here. With all of these pieces relating back to the support of the cornerstone. And how do we uh, join together in this? How do we come together and are jointed together? We are jointed together when each individual believer in the body of Christ is properly functioning in their spiritual gift, whatever their spiritual gift is, and when they're functioning in that, we are then, you know what we're doing? We're locking arms then. We're supporting each other. And, and that's what the spiritual gifts do when we use them properly. And I ask you, do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Are you using those spiritual gifts? I know your pastor has preached through that. And notice verse 21 this is interesting. It's easy to get caught up on numbers, isn't it? Especially in our day and time. Uh, when it comes to church, it's so easy to get caught up in numbers. Uh, for the longest, uh, when I became pastor, we had uh, in the back of our church the, the ushers, and they had done this for years. Uh, they had a book back there, and, and they would count, and, and they would keep record. They would go through and, and they'd walk down the aisles and they'd do this, you know. And, and I said, guys, I don't want to do that. I don't like the way that looks. And, and I, I don't know if you do it here or not. If so, I just I made myself look bad. <laughs> but uh, our church is set up a little differently. And, and they would come all the way down the main aisles. It was kind of hard to, for them to hide and do that. And I kept throwing that book away over and over and time and time again. They'd go get another book. And I kept throwing it away. They'd go get another book. I said, guys, look, I don't want to be about numbers. And, but it's so easy to get caught up in numbers. And look, we all desire to grow, and we should. And you know, when, when we do things right, we are going to grow, and this church is proof of that. But it's interesting here in verse 21, the emphasis on growing is on growing in holiness, not in numbers. Because remember, get this, He's addressing the Ephesian believers who once worshipped in the temple of Artemis, the goddess of Diana. And notice verse 21 again. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. You'd be surprised at how many commentaries and theologians state that this is speaking about numerical growth, and it's not. You know, in hermeneutics we learn when... Uh, the text makes plain sense. Seek no other sense. And this makes plain sense. And it's the same in the Greek. And they groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And it was important because these people were coming out of paganistic worship, worshiping the goddess of Diana, but now for once they could have true, holy worship and they could grow in that holiness. Holiness is the main objective in the church. In the Old Testament, when God saw the temple was imperfect, He wrote Ichabod over it, and His glory departed. Listen, God doesn't dwell in any unholy place. If it's not holy, God's not in it. Paul really wants us to get a grip on who we are in Christ. And he really wants, to, wants us to understand this idea of unity. And Tuesday morning, you'll see just how important it was to the Apostle Paul uh, that he get across this point to us to be unified. And folks, listen, the way we see the world going today, boy, do we ever need to be unified in the church. Learning to get along, in closing, learning to get along with the Jews was a lot better than their hopeless past. Amen? And it's a, for us, learning to get along with believers and loving one another, hey, it's a lot better than our past too, amen? In the family of God, we're not bound together by class, culture, or color. We're not bound together by humor, personality, or exaggerated hype. In the family of God, there's only one binding agent, and that is the blood of Jesus. That is the blood of Jesus. As John Fawcett wrote, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. 
The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. Without unity in the body of Christ, we'll never achieve holiness. And if it's not holy, God's not in it. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Lord Jesus, teach us about unity. Help us, Lord, to apply this to our lives. Lord, it's so important. As we see all that the Apostle Paul went through to get this message across to us. Lord, I thank you for the unity here. It's so evident. And I thank you for the hearts of these people. But Lord, should there be someone here tonight that may would have a difference with someone. Lord God, I pray even after the service, they would go to them and say, hey, we're family. Hey, let's put this behind us. And Lord, we thank you for what you'll do in Christ's holy name. Amen. Let's stand with bowed heads. I want you to think about what Pastor Ham has said tonight. Without him even realizing it, this so dovetails with our ministry here. The reason it does is because it's Bible expository preaching. And that's what reaches the heart of believers. It's not about entertainment. It's about edifying and educating. And how many times he brought out evangelism? So as we think about a, a biblical view of the church at Ephesus, and their great need for unity hasn't changed one bit to today. And we have to work on it constantly. And that's why pastors cannot let that go. They have to deal with it. It helps strengthen not only the church, but it will strengthen your family. Anyone who is not right with their family often becomes a casualty in their church. And you can't afford that. And that's why unity is so important. So if you're here tonight 